you're thinking of joining the Sinclair DNA study, your timing is impeccable because we're about to enter a great new chapter. We're calling it the Big Y. We're calling it that because that's what Family Tree DNA is calling their new extensive S&P test. Back when we started the Sinclair DNA study in 2004, we were working with STRs. Those are called short tandem repeats. And what you would test for was uh, 12 markers, 37 markers, 67 markers, or 111 markers. Actually, back in, in 2004, it was 12 markers or 25 markers. That's all we had. We seriously thought we were learning a lot. In retrospect, we knew almost nothing that we know today. Everything changed when the focus started to move towards S&P studies. Those are called single nucleotide polymorphisms. STRs, the marker tests, are known to mutate at a certain rate. You know, roughly once every 300 to 500 years a mutation might happen. Single nucleotide polymorphisms, S&Ps, are believed to mutate only once and then never again. So they're perfect for genealogy testing, for pairing up your genealogy documents with your DNA test. The problem has been that for many of our lineages, the Sinclair lineages, we have 12, for many of those, there were no really recent SNPs to test for. I'm in a lineage, I'm lucky enough to be what's called L193. My lineage, the Alexander Sinclair lineage of Glasgow, is as all tested, or many of us have tested and tested positive for this SNP called L193. The age of that mutation is believed to be between 800 and 1,000 years ago. Now that's getting really close to the time period of medieval record keeping. And you do see that some of the families that we match in L193 do seem to be circling around one another in uh, medieval documents, medieval land transfer records, and gifts to priories and abbeys. That's when it gets really exciting. What Big Y is promising all of us is exactly that, getting every lineage we have more recent S&P tests. I don't want you to get the idea that I'm asking every member of our study to take this test, the big Y, because it's not cheap. Uh, there's an introductory offer, but then, you know, it's going to be fairly expensive after that. Uh, while it's a lot less money than a Gene 2.0 test and gives us uh, what I believe will be better results, it's still fairly expensive and it's not going to be necessary for each and every member of our study to do this. My plan is to ask one member of each of our 12 lineages to take this test and the others ask them to kick in a little bit of money to help defray the costs of this test. Then it may be necessary later on to test uh, one other person in each lineage who has a genetic distance further away from the first one tested. We're going to take this step by step and, and try to do it in the most cost effective manner possible. So I will be contacting one person in each lineage. I think you already know who you are and I'll be uh, asking you to take the test. It does not require a new sample from what I understand. They can use a sample already in the lab, in the freezer. And um, I don't know how long it'll take as results start to come back. I suspect there's going to be a fairly rapid adoption of this because it's a big deal and because it's a really good price relative to what you get. I think the uh, results could take a while to come back and it's going to be important that we also test, and this is the key, each lineage is going to have to also test some of the critical names who they match. Like I know the names I'm going to be testing or asking to test different surnames in our lineages. Our Herdmanston lineage, for instance, I'm going to be testing certain particular people with different surnames who also have that uh, uh, P310 L11 S&P that they have. We're going to get much more recent on that and every other lineage in our family. We'll start by looking for names of interest in each of our current S&Ps. These are some names of great interest who share the P310L11 S&P with our Hermanston lineage. Because P310L11 is fairly old, we may see some of these names drop out as more recent S&Ps are discovered. We'll use Big Y's new S&Ps to search for connections between these surnames. Remember, surnames only began to become fixed during the 12th century. The first ones that will come in will likely be the oldest S&Ps, those like P310L11 that all these families share. 
then we'll likely see some shared by only two or three of these families. After that, we'll each eventually find what are called family S&Ps, meaning they are unique to your particular family. S&P study groups look for TMRCA, time to most recent common ancestor, for each S&P that's discovered. The ability to pin a time frame and particular surnames onto an S&P is what makes this so exciting. It's what makes it work. This plus medieval records research will finally answer the questions you've been wanting to know. I interviewed Bennett Greenspan, the chairman of Family Tree DNA, on Block Talk Radio Show. And Bennett talked about how at some point we're going to reach the point where the family, the branches of the family trees coming up from Africa over into uh, Eurasia, over into Europe and Southern Europe during the Ice Age and then back up. We know those, we roughly know where we were, all of us do, based on uh, our S&P testing and our, our standard markers. Now, through deeper S&P tests, these branches are going to continue to get further and further up until they finally connect to the leaves. You and I are the leaves. You and I and our recent ancestors are those leaves and we're going to finally know so much more about our family. This could be the last test you have to take with family tree DNA, the big why.